as an athlete, Kyle wrote, was a cut above. As a human being, as a man, he was a cut above. And so today we're here to celebrate, to give thanks, and to enjoy remembrances of a very special soul. There's one psalm that I think belongs to everybody. We know it as the 23rd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his namesake. And even though I walk through the darkest of valleys, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, it runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We remember Kyle wrote, and first is his son, Kyle Jr. Kyle? Well, good morning. On behalf of Betty Nina and many of the uh, Rote family members that are here, we very much appreciate your presence. And uh, I know in the next few minutes you're going to be uh, entertained, I hope in some ways uh, inspired. Um, but beyond that, I hope you'll be impacted and infected with um, something that was very special about my dad as we go down uh, memory lane. Uh, in light of that, I would ask that you listen not simply with your ears and with your heart, but that you listen with your soul as well. The uh, great intellect Daniel Webster, not related to Alex, by the way, I don't think, uh, one day was asked this question, what's the most important truth that you've ever come across? And his answer was this, that one day I will have to stand before God and give an account for myself. That truth will face us all. And as massive as his accomplishments were, and they were massive, and certainly no one in our, my part of the family will ever compete with those, the most important thing about my father was not all the things that we read in the newspaper. The most important thing about my dad was not his accomplishments but it was his relationship with God. And that's what gives us certainty today about where he is and in whose presence he stands. I rejoice this morning because beyond the genius of my father in so many areas, um, there was the simple understanding that is available to every single one of us, and if you ever have a chance to read the poem piece at the back of your program, please do that later on. But it spoke to the theology of the man who understood that what we do in life is not as significant as who we trust in life. And while I am amazed and so thankful for the vast friendships that he has had. I'm amazed with the records and honors that he's had. He's in several halls of fame, and I can tell you this morning that I don't have any certainty as to whether he will ever be in Canton's Hall of Fame, but I can give you complete certainty that he's in God's Hall of Fame of Faithfulness. And so this morning, rejoice in that truth. 
May you be blessed with the simplicity of it, not the complexity of my father's accomplishments. And understand that that is not only something to rejoice in, something to meditate on, something to be blessed in, but may, may you also be encouraged and challenged by that same truth. When uh, his time came, he was prepared because of in whom he trusted. To God be the glory. Thank you, Kyle. Sister Nita. I didn't wear my glasses actually on purpose. <laughs> oh, uh, this is so beautiful. We are here, each of us, to honor and celebrate a great man, an exceptional athlete, an inspirational poet, artist, writer, father, grandfather, friend and mentor. He was so many things to so many people, uh, deeply touching the lives of everyone who met him, who heard him speak, who read his words. We each have our own story with him, and here is a little bit of mine. Kyle came into my life when I was a child, two years old, marrying my mother when I was six, becoming my Papa Kylie. My early impressions of him were of his greatness as a magician. I had my favorite magic tricks that he never tired of regaling me with. I also vividly remember my parents getting ready to go out dancing and how elegant and beautiful they both were. You could see and feel the love between them and I was very, very proud. From here to North Dakota, from Palm Springs to Palm Beach, the many, many golf tournaments, they took me everywhere with them. We were a fearsome three, sharing many adventures along the way. And as I grew up, Kyle remained a constant source of support and wisdom to me. He was never a disciplinary figure, Kylie. He um, never told me to clean up my room or do my homework. <laughs> a really ideal father. And, uh, but he did teach by example. He taught me self-respect, respect for others, for everything. And his gentleness, his gentleness permeated everything he did. I always knew never to disturb him when he was writing. And he had these long periods of contemplation. But I so loved to watch him. And I remember also being in awe of his uh, speedy um, what is it? It's finish, finish of the, uh, the New York Times crossword puzzle every morning. <laughs> it was just this extraordinary thing to witness. And, and at 12 also the excitement, I remember, at 12 years old, of being able to stay up late with my parents watching the Honeymooners. That was something that will always remain a vivid memory for me. Um, and the poetry, actually, that was always there. I remember the poems left on my mother's pillow, in the kitchen, lying on a stack of papers, waiting to be discovered. I was privy to a great romance, and a lesson in what love is really made of, pure, unconditional, and eternal.
With a word or comment, he had me, too, sitting and pondering my life, my future, my dreams. And as I grew older, my appreciation of him as an artist as well grew. Um, the thoughts behind the images, the ideas behind the picture, he always made you think more. He always made you want to be the best you could be for him. He taught of facing your fears, standing for what is just and right, for what you believe in. And he taught of the greatness and the humility which is in all of us. What an extraordinary gift to give everyone. The utter important importance of being just who you are and living life to your potential and beyond that. And though his blood doesn't run through my veins, his ideas and his compassion and his humility will run, always, never cease to run through my mind and my heart. I am who I am, actually, because of him. All right, Gilkinson is going to speak a few words and then sing. Hello? Oh, hi. As you will hear throughout this memorial, Kyle was a man of many talents. I will always remember him as a gentleman, a good friend, and someone who loved my mother and made her very happy. Uh, he dedicated all of his poetry and his music to her. This song, composed by Kyle, is called Reality and is for my mother. In the evening's shadowed light, I walk with you. Through the long and lonely night, I talk with you. Once again, I feel you're here. Somehow, I guess reality is all I'm missing now. Morning comes and you are gone just for the day. While you're gone, I make believe you're just away. Then I smile and you appear somehow. I guess reality is all I'm missing now. When I feel raindrops, are those just my tears? Are my happiest moments just reflecting my Is a dreamer called me in the silence of my room I reach for you with my love for you full bloom I reach for you once again I reality is all I'm missing now. I 
I guess reality is all I'm missing now. That was lovely, Laurie. Thank you. And Paul LaBelle. Hello, I'm Paul LaBelle. Kyle Rote was my grandfather. I'm speaking for my brothers as well who were not able to make it today. This is a section from Emerson's um, Self-Reliance. It is easy to live in the world after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after your own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd, keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. My grandfather was that great man that lived in that perfect sweetness. I love him for it. Shortly after his death, my grandmother and mother were going through numerous amounts of papers of things that he had written, poems, songs, essays, and one of the things that they came across was a guide on how to live your life that he had been working on. And it started off with hygiene and keeping yourself clean and fresh, presentable, and went on to clothing, always wearing the proper attire, never being out of place, looking respectable. Speech, being courteous and kind to everyone never using filthy language, especially not in front of women, your elders, or young children. But the most important things that came out of his guide to life was how you serve others before you serve yourself, and how you always express thanks when people do good things for you or good deeds for you. But what I remember most about my grandfather was him coming to all of my uh, Little League games, my brother's Little League games, the pizza parties afterwards, the award ceremonies, whether we won or lost, he was always, always there and always happy. Christmases, Thanksgivings, dinners, he would sit at one head of the table, my father would sit at the other. He would write us poems each for our birthday. He really loved your cooking, Grandma. Uh, I love the man very much. And I'll, I want to leave you with a poem that he wrote, which, well, it's probably for everyone in this room. It's called The Process by Kyle Rode. When you know what you want, and you know where you are, and you fixed your sights on that special star, and your dreams are all clear, and you've conquered some doubt. My friend, you are learning what you're all about. Will you plan where you go, and you go where you plan, and the world can tell you're nobody's man. When your message is heard, and you don't need to shout, my friend, you are learning what you're all about. And when friends go their way, and you walk on alone pursuing the dreams that you've always known, and you stand by yourself, and you've worked it all out, my friend, you are learning what you are all about. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And Wellington Marab will speak next.
my earliest remembrance of Carl wrote from his rookie show 51 years ago. He sang Tears on My Pillow. And it became a, that rendition became a staple at all giant team functions for many years after that. He also spoke about his arrival in New York as he emerged from the Holland Tunnel, a sharp-looking individual approached the car and said, hey, Whitey, want to buy a watch? Kyle said, I didn't buy the watch. Luckily, I had no money. That was his arrival. Now, 51 years later, as he was preparing to take his leave, he wrote these words. And I think we do want it to Carl wrote more by reading his words than by any words of mine that I could possibly add. Prepare me for my journey, Lord, across this rough terrain, and give me your perspective that I may endure the pain. Instill in me your patience, Lord, that I will thus employ with reason and stability the purest forms of joy. Anoint my soul's humility, for life is not a race. Permit the loss to reconvene resume their proper place. At crossroads, grant me discipline that I may stay on track, and having passed temptation, be there no wish to look back. And finally, my Lord, my friend, envelop me with love, that I need seek no further for your kingdom up above. Kyle, thank you for giving us this peek into your soul. God bless, God speed. Ali Sherman. stand before you, and as we've been here in these last minutes, you look back, of course. And Kyle wrote was a, a special happening to, uh, to a bunch of lives, our lives. In those days, they had a bonus pick. And I think that uh, the wise choice that Willing Tamara made put a new interpretation on bonus. It really said, after we saw him for about two or three days and we worked out with him, he was something special. And I, in the coaching business, it's got a particular, unique difference of maybe any other business there is. There's an inventory to that business, but it is a unique inventory the only inventory in it is the human element. What is he? Where does he focus? How much does he want to be the best? The application of the mentality, the ability to walk through minus times and handle the plus times properly. This is what makes a great ball player high standards, and it makes, of course, a team that has 
a great happen for it. And in those first weeks that we saw this rookie work, we all felt we were, we, you know, you're, you're superstitious in that business too, besides coping with the human element. We were afraid to say it, but we were looking at what was going to be, in my humble opinion, one of the greatest that ever played the game. He could do it all. He could run. And he could catch the ball. And he could throw the ball. We have, at that time, as time went on, we had one of the greatest option passes, the back that runs, that could throw the ball. And Frank Gifford, I personally felt that he was better than Paul Horning, who was a man that did that and was great at it. But Kyle could do it all, along with what Frank did. He was a great runner, and we were walking off the field one day talking about what makes a runner outstanding and more of a tremendous pressure on the other ball club. And uh, who are the guys that have that? And he came up with it. He said, uh, you don't have to be the fastest, but what you got to have, you've got to understand that you must have four speeds. You've got to be able to shift those gears. And that's as plain a language as you want. It gave me a wonderful coaching point. I learned from Kyle many things. And that's what he was. He could shift those gears right through life. And in the ball games that we had, unfortunately, in the first couple of weeks that he arrived, we were running a drill and he hit a tough spot on the terrain and his knee came out. And he always suffered with knees that were problems. As a result, we lost the opportunity for the world to see this guy who was going to be, in my mind, a, an outstanding ball player, which he was. But the running was kind of left from him. But he became a great pass receiver. He had, the, he had the drive and the motivation and the things you've just heard in these last moments. He set a very high standard. And while we were working, and I'll never forget that, and uh, he was going up and down those stadium stairs, and you do that for a year or so, by the way, if you're looking for some good conditioning, that will do it. And it takes a strong discipline. It takes, a, it takes what great performers have, setting a high standard of excellence to achieve and to be able to come together with the people that are depending on you. And he became then a wide receiver. And without that great speed, but four speeds, knowing when to turn it on and what to do with it, was truly a great receiver. Along with that, that's Kyle Rote, the football player. He is one of the finest human beings that I have ever come in contact with. And in my, in my world, I've been in contact with a lot of human beings. He could play baseball and very likely was a candidate for AAA baseball. He was, I, I never found out for sure well, but he was an outstanding golfer, was he? You would be the one that well, no, he was fair golfer. I, uh, <laughs> I was told he was. I never saw him play it. But, and one day uh, he, he uh, moved up, he and Frank Gifford moved up close to where uh, my wife and I were living in Westchester. And we went over to visit one evening. We had some dinner and just talking. And I, I was looking through his den and all, and I saw the things that we were just talking about. The poetry he wrote, 
he was quite an individual, a blessing to have the opportunity for anybody to walk with and to know the true realities of walking to the highest point that we can. And as it's a man that I consider, a person that I consider making me feel very fortunate in having had the opportunity with all the rest of us. He was truly, truly what we have just heard earlier and what we heard of the words from his heart. Y.A. Nina wrote, instructed me several times, introduce you as Yelberton, Abraham Tittle, Jr. Thank you. I first met uh, Cal Rote uh, back when I was in <clears throat> high school in Marshall, Texas. Cal was uh, a young person, a little bit younger than myself, and I looked out the window in my study hall class and I saw this young kid out there throwing passes and kicking the football, and a lot of young students out watching this young man. I thought to myself at first, this is amazing. <clears throat> I said, where, where is he from? He said, well, he's from San Antonio, Texas, and he's up here visiting an aunt. And I was, that relieved me, because I was scared to death that this kid was coming to Marshall, because <laughs> why Tittle wouldn't be a star there anymore. <laughs> but I did follow his career while he was in high school. He was at Thomas Jefferson, Jeff Davis High School in San Antonio, and then also at SMU, where he became an All-American. Uh, I had a special interest in him because of that one incident in Marshall. In Marshall. Uh, following his career <clears throat> to the New York Giants, I played against Kyle when I was uh, with San Francisco, and he was always a great football star, always a great football star. But I really didn't know him that well until I came to New York in 1961. <clears throat> he was a player and a player coach. Uh, and then I realized what Kyle wrote was really about. He was so good to all of us new players. We had, <clears throat> we had so many new players that Ali Sherman had brought to the New York Giants in 1961. Myself, um, uh, Joe Walton, a tight end, who became a star and a coach at the Jets. Um, Dale Schaffner, who could run faster than the wind. He was a split end. He brought him in from the Los Angeles Rams. We had lots of new players. E. Rich Barnes came to New York in 1962. Um, that's, Hugh McElhinney came in 62 or 3, I forget. A lot of new players. And, and you know, in New York, uh, uh, coming here, it's a wonderful place. Uh, this is the hub of everything, the media capital of the world. But to be in New York and to not have friends can be the loneliest place in the world. Uh, if you're a loser, you'll really be lonely. <laughs> but we were not losing. But really and truly, Kyle Rote uh, was a different person to me. He was not Kyle Rote, the football player, the great high school athlete that I had seen play or remembered when he was in grammar school. He was really a good friend. He, was a, he played as a player. He coached as a coach. If the Giants had player coaches at, in those years. <clears throat> And Kyle made everything um, just perfect for new players. I came in without an automobile. My wife is still in California. Uh, we didn't know whether I was going to make the team or what was going to happen. Uh, but um, he helped me. He introduced me to some car dealer, and I got a new car, to, a loaner car. He helped me get a house. He introduced me to a real estate agent that got me a house up in White Plains. Uh, he was just wonderful, not just with me, but with all players that came in here. He seemed to take a, 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 a something that 
not many people knew that was going on with the New York Giants. He was truly a good friend to all his teammates and to all the new players that came here. Um, I think I'll just end this by saying, Wellington Mayor said something nice about me that I'll never forgot, was when I was introduced into the Hall of Fame in <clears throat> Canton, Ohio, he said that uh, Y.A. Tittle loved New York and New York loved Y.A. Tittle. That was a great saying and I always remember that. I'm going to repeat it again. Uh, New York loved Kyle Rote, Kyle Rote loved New York, and Kyle Rote loved, I think, everyone he ever met. Thank you. Frank Gifford. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to keep this to just a few words because I know that's how Kyle would have wanted it. But you know, it's really difficult to put into a few words some 50 years of a special friendship, a friendship that began on the football field, then grew into so many other aspects of our lives. And let me just say something right up front. As far as I'm concerned, Kyle wrote was one of the greatest athletes that I've ever seen. I think he could have played professional baseball. I think he could have played professional golf if he'd have taken it up. But Kyle chose football, and because he did, all of us who played with him were blessed with the opportunity to get to know a remarkable human being. Kyle's 11-year career with the Giants could have been so much greater had he not stepped into a gopher hole or something like that as a rookie back in 1951, tearing up his knee in an exhibition game. Kyle would go on to play remarkably for 11 years, setting Giants records as a wide receiver and making plays that amazed even us, and doing it on what amounted to one leg and often in excruciating pain. I came in the next year and I think well drafted me to be a defensive back. And one of the things I used to kid Kyle about that gopher hole was that they moved Kyle to wide receiver and I went to running back. Had that not happened, had that not gopher hole not been there, Kyle would have been in the Hall of Fame and I probably would have been that defensive back that helped make Johnny Unitas and Ray Berry legends. <laughs> but he was truly remarkable. Off the playing field, we all looked up to Kyle as our quiet, thoughtful, totally unselfish leader. I think the main reason so many of us would choose to name our children after Kyle, and you heard so much about it today from, from so many already, we saw in him what we lacked in ourselves. Our friendship was something special in my life, and I like to think it was in Kyle's. It was a wonderful place to go when we needed to talk about what was going on in our lives, our families, or just talk about the good old days of PJs, Shores, Minucci's, or kids, and then later grandchildren. It's hard to believe that Kyle's grandson John and my grandson Michael, last year, this really happened, just by the luck of the draw, met his dorm roommates at Stanford University. And Kyle and I chuckled about that. We could just imagine the two of them, Michael and John, trying to argue over whose grandpa was the best football player. <laughs> That's what Kyle and I talked about the last time we were together in this past spring. I wish that I had said then what I would like to say now, and that is what an extraordinary life Kyle shared with so many of us. He touched us all with a rare and a delicate grace, and the fact that he never once complained about a gopher hole in Jonesboro, Arkansas, says to me so much about the character of this wonderful man we were all so privileged to know. Next person to speak is Bill Fugazi. Bill? Kyle was not only an outstanding athlete. He was a wonderful, caring person. He was a devoted father and husband and a loyal friend. He was a role model 
the likes of which don't come along very often. He was someone who I was deeply proud to call my friend. He was passionate about everything he did. If you ever took him on the golf course, you knew exactly what I'm talking about. I met Kyle when he was running around town with a group of stud football players. They called themselves the New York Giants. They were a proud group. I will always remember our post-game dinners coming up to my house in Harrison with Kyle and the GIF and Charlie Connolly. They'd arrive most of the time after the home games. I think he just came for the pasta. Even if the Giants had lost, he'd always talk about the bright spots. That's the kind of person he was. I will always cherish those memories. We all know what he did on the field, but I remember what he did off the field, advocating for children and youngsters, helping students excel in their academics, and using sports as motivation. He never missed our All-American Golf Tournaments, helping to raise funds for young stars to be able to go through college. His family should be proud of his legacy. Thank you, Kyle, for your friendship. May you rest peacefully in heaven. And Lamar Hunt. My name is Lamar Hunt. I was born in Arkansas, but I moved to East Texas, obviously with my parents, when I was just two weeks old. I've lived in Texas ever since, and I think that qualifies me today as a Texan. Uh, I come to you today with that credential. Uh, Nina Rode asked me to read a handwritten note she received from former president George Bush. Now this is the one known down in Texas as George 41, the former president. The letter said, Dear Nina, I was sorry to get the news about Kyle. A great man is now in heaven, and I know that your heart must ache. My most sincere condolences go out to you, signed George Bush. Once my family got to Texas, I began to really learn about the game of football and the heritage of that sport in the state. Unbelievably, there were four national collegiate championship teams in a single five-year period between 1935 and 39, and the names of the Texas football legend from the 30s and the 40s are many. Sammy Ball, Davey O'Brien, John Kimbrough, Bobby Lane, and Doak Walker are the true giants of the sport. But in the late 1940s, another name was added to that list. His name was William Kyle Rote. He was born in San Antonio and grew up to be a Friday night hero, as they call him in Texas. At Jefferson High School there in San Antonio, Kyle became the first player to be an all-state performer in two sports, baseball and football, in the same season. He was to be highly recruited, and he ended up at Southern Methodist University, where he teamed up with Doak Walker in one of the greatest college backfields of all time, Walker and Rote, Rote and Walker. No matter how you said it, they were a remarkable pair in the finest era of Texas college football. At the end of the 1949 Southern Methodist University season, with Doak Walker out with an injury, it was to have been his last game, but Kyle Rode on that day was to play his most memorable game. And if you haven't seen it on the back page of the program for today, there's a remarkable piece referring to that game. The opponent was Frank Leahy's Notre Dame Fighting Irish, and on that day they completed their fourth consecutive undefeated season. 
On the other side of the field, Kyle Rote scored all three SMU touchdowns that day, and Southwest sports writers voted it the greatest individual athletic performance by a Texan in the first half of the 20th century. You will understand that Texans are a bit provincial when I tell you a little story about that. The headline in a prominent newspaper the next day said, SMU beats the Irish 20 to 27. <laughs> the story I've just told you <coughs> was from the eyes of a teenager who loved SMU football. And I, of course, was that teenager. Uh, two years later, I was to go to SMU where I would become a four-year bench warmer. But, but always among my idols was that incomparable pair, Doak Walker and Kyle Rote. Kyle Rote and Doak Walker. I'm proud to have known about Kyle and have a chance to follow his college and pro career as a fan, and then later to have the opportunity to know him personally. He was indeed a warm friend of his school, SMU, and his sport. He was to broadcast football games, with which I was associated a number of years later, uh, not, uh, not obviously as a player, but in a management position. He was to father a fine young man, Kyle Rote, Jr., who you've also already heard from, and I was years later to have an association with Kyle, Jr. I'm proud to be able to represent Southern Methodist University here today, the college at which Kyle had those glory years. And also, I suspect on this day, I represent all those teenagers whose lives were touched by our friend Kyle Rote. God rest. Is Roy Ennis here? Roy, thank you. I am old enough to remember the great exploits of Carl Rode. Carl, Kyle and Nina have been great supporters of the Congress of Racial Equality, always attending our affairs. I would hope, of course, that Nina will continue. The years of the 50s and 60s that Kyle rose to stardom as a hero of his sport and as a leader coincided with a tremendous struggle and turmoil in America. We had been successful in World War II. We had hit the international stage as the leaders of the world. But there was much unfinished business, socially and politically, in America. Those were the bad old days. Young people from CORE, the NAACP, the Urban League, Dr. King's organization challenge that unfinished business with the Civil Rights Revolution. We won that struggle. It was the most successful social and political revolution in the history of mankind, occurred in the shortest period of time with the least amount of bloodshed. That battle was won by all Americans, not just by Dr. King and the young people in CORE and the NAACP and the Urban League and other organizations. It was won by all Americans. Many of them struggled actively, quietly. Kyle was one of those people. There was a system in America in that period, even after sports were desegregated. That system existed with orchestras when blacks and whites played together. Baseball teams, football teams, basketball teams. And the black players had to seek separate accommodation. 
Cairo was one of those who resisted that tradition. And in that very period of turmoil, the 50s and 60s, Kyle would violate that putrid custom and stay with the black players. That's why he's my hero, and that's the kind of leadership that he offered to the civil rights movement. These are the kinds of people who quietly struggled all over America to make America the great country it is. And Warner Wolf. I didn't know Kyle as uh, well as most of you, but uh, I knew him well enough to know that he was uh, a very humble man. Also, he never took himself too serious. And he had an interesting sense of humor. I remember interviewing Kyle one time and asking him about the famous 1958 overtime game against the Colts. And I said, Kyle, remember that play where Charlie Connerly hit you, 62-yard gain, and you ran down the field and then fumbled? And Alex Webster picked up the ball and ran it to the one? Yeah, he says, I remember that. Sure, I remember that play. He says, I called that play. <laughs> he says, but I didn't call the fumble. <laughs> I've been influenced indirectly. Uh, Kyle never knew this, and I just told Nina about a year ago, uh, I've been influenced by Kyle and Nina. It's strange how life works. I was 12 years old, December 1949, sitting at home uh, working on a model airplane. That's what we used to do in those days. And I had the radio on. And there was this description of this game. I'd never seen a college football game, nor had I paid much attention to it. I was basically interested in boxing and baseball and would listen to it on the radio, everything. Well, this Saturday, I was listening to this college football game. And the announcer, I believe, was Bill Stern. And he was so excited. I'm saying, Wow, listen to this guy. What a way to make a living. He's describing the game. And at the end, he said, and this, Notre Dame won the game. But that's not the story. He said, the story is Kyle wrote. And as Bill Stern was describing the, the plays, I, I was picturing Kyle in my head. I was actually seeing him run down the field. He said, Kyle wrote ran for 115 yards, threw for 145 yards, punted for an average of 48 yards a kick, scored three touchdowns and kicked two extra points. He said, that's the story. And I said, wow. I said, now that's interesting. So you don't have to win. That's not necessarily the story. And I always remember that. And I have applied that to my sports cast. It was the first time I was aware of something like that. So Kyle influenced my career. Now the second thing, believe it or not, two months later, you're talking about over 50 years ago, I went to high school. And there was this, in those days we called them gym teachers. There was no such thing as a phys ed teacher. It just didn't. It was a gym teacher. Well, there was this guy. He was an elderly gentleman. You know, of course, when you're 12 years old, you, somebody 40 is, is an old guy. Well, this gentleman, 
he was the gym teacher. And I had him for three years. And one of the exercises was you had to climb a rope which was attached to the ceiling. Well, not everyone could do it. But it didn't matter because this gentleman would come over to you afterwards and say, son, don't worry about it. You're a good sport. You're a good sport. He would go up to everyone sooner or later and say, you're a good sport. And I always remember that. I said, gee, you don't have to be great. It's, hey, there's another side of this. You're a good sport. And that gym teacher was Captain Lamack. We would call him Captain Lamack. And Captain Lamack was Nina Roth's father. So both Kyle and uh, Nina uh, influenced my life indirectly. Uh, Nina wrote a note to me that said, I pray that Kyle is up there meeting my father. I'm sure he is. Joe Burden is up from Washington today and is going to sing. Joe? I be discouraged? Why must the shadows come? Why must my heart be lonely and search for heaven? With Jesus as my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. watches me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me I say
Thank you, Joe. As we all know, Kyle Roth was a deeply spiritual man, uh, a man of profound uh, thought and trust and belief and spirit. And I live with a belief that the, after we die, we stay close for a while. We're around. And I'd like to think that Kyle has been here today, is here now. And Joe, as you sing the eye is on the sparrow, he say, yeah, it's true. It, it's there. A portion of a letter from Glenn, Jack Kemp. I don't think in all the 13 years of professional football and over two decades in political life that I have met anyone who stands out more in my mind's eye than Kyle wrote. As I write these words, I can see his grin, and I can hear his wit, his wisdom, and his humor. Kyle was a terrific athlete, but more important, he was a first and foremost a great teammate, a loyal friend, and just a wonderful human being. Along with everyone, I'll miss Kyle wrote, but take comfort in the fact that in this life and legacy lives on in our memory as well as the annals of college and professional football history. Just one reflection, if I may. It is my belief that when we die, we, we meet our maker. We have to account for what we did with our lives. I'd like to think that we're going to be asked two questions. First question is, what did you do with what you were given? What did you do with your talent, your gift, your promise? What did you do with the dreams that were given you? What did you do with the faith tradition that you were born into? Was it nurtured? Did you develop it? Was the soul expanded? We know that when Kyle Roth was asked that question, that he had a very fulfilling discussion with his maker. Then the second question is, how did you love? Did you care? Did you have respect? Were you kind? Were you empathetic? Did you listen? Did you forgive? Did you forgive? Did you forgive? Big one. We all know because we know Kyle wrote, we knew him, uh, how he answered that because he, he loved. He really knew how to love. And so today we've had a wonderful celebration of a great life. He's affected everybody. He has touched us all, and we thank God for him. His favorite hymn, is in the garden. It's on the opposite page of the order of service. Would you stand now as we sing this together?
Would you be seated? If you'll bow your heads with me for a prayer. Gracious and loving and giving God, we give you thanks for this time together to think and to reflect, to remember, and to give back some love. We're profoundly grateful for Kyle Rote, for his extraordinary life, not only for his sports journey, but in particular, his human journey and the spiritual part of that. We are affected by his faith, the depth of it, the strength of it, the gentleness of it. We ask this blessing continue with us that every time we think of Kyle Rowe, we, we are blessed with a spirit of gentleness and love. I ask you to be with Nina and all the children and the grandchildren and all the wonderful people of his family and to be with each one of us, keeping us in your loving care. For this time of worship and celebration, Lord, we are very grateful, and we say thank you. Be with us in every way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Camelia Johnson. Thank you, Kenneth Dake. Nina wrote, bless you. Everyone here loves you very much. With the benediction, I'm going to read Kyle's poem, Peace. I've searched for peace on mountaintops and down by country streams. And I've resorted in my search to analyzing dreams. I've been, even cruised far from my shore with hopes that peace dwell there. But I was not to find my peace afloat in salty air. I finally gave up the hunt that had consumed my life and settled down to figure out the causes of my strife. And as I started into prayer, God chose to set me free. He placed my hand within his hand, and peace enveloped me. Go in peace. May the peace of God go with you. Amen. Thank you.